We're ready. Okay, we want to welcome everyone today um, to the Beneficial Garden Helpers uh, webinar, and uh, we are excited that we have a professor of entomology for the University of Georgia. Um, she's also the Director of Extension for Urban Agriculture and the Interim Dean of the University of Georgia Urban Campus. So thank you, Dr. Brayman, for joining us today. Hello, and I'm so excited. Thank you for all uh, participating in this afternoon's webinar. I'm uh, very glad to be with you. Uh, we're talking today about beneficial garden helpers. And of course, insects are um, something that I am fascinated with, but I know that not everybody shares that interest. And in fact, very often we are focused on the injurious aspects of insects. But today we're going to focus on the beneficial. And of course, insects are beneficial in so many ways. And I have a short list of these on the left-hand side. And for this particular webinar, we're really going to focus on their biological control aspects and how they are beneficial in terms of helping us in our pest control efforts. So our landscapes truly are living landscapes and insects are a part of that. What we want to focus on this afternoon are friends rather than foes. But certainly we need to spend a minute talking about foes because that all factors into the IPM approach. And some pests, as this little illustration indicates, are just bigger than others and can really consume a great deal of our time and attention and, in fact, can be drivers of the system at structuring our pest management approaches. And so when I think of some of these uh, key pests, I sometimes think of the invasive insects illustrated in this slide. And here we're seeing on the top two illustrations uh, chili thrips and their damage. And then if, if we travel around uh, clockwise in the bottom right hand side, hemlock woolly adelgis would be another insect that has uh, tremendously impacted our area. Uh, in the bottom center of your screen, you see a uh, brown marmorated stink bug, and then just to the left of that, kudzu bugs. So these would be uh, key pests that can come in and disrupt um, an ecological balance that has in the past allowed us to conserve our natural enemies. But in the grand scheme of things, over 97% of our insects are beneficial or could be considered innocent bystanders. But as we know, uh, some of this is in the eye of the beholder. So really, we're the ones that are deciding what's a pest and what's not a pest. If we are concerned about the larva or this little caterpillar uh, destroying the flowers on what it is a milkweed plant, um, some observing this may not realize that that's the larva or the caterpillar of the monarch butterfly. So in fact, identification becomes very key as well as our perspective. Let's show this little video here. And on a beautiful summer day, Maybe we can see this plume of butterflies uh, just streaming down the side of a fence. And we have the, the lovely summer sounds. But then, of course, we realize that those are cabbage worm butterflies. So while they may be appealing from, from a, a wildlife standpoint, we do know that they can cause damage to plants that we're trying to grow. So that may be uh, perceived as a, a particular pest in the area. So just being able to identify the insects 
whether they are friends or foes, and in fact, whether we can tolerate uh, damage. So what do we have going on in this particular slide? Well, if we take a, take a look, we're looking at aphids here. And so we know that these are aphids, uh, in part because of the cornicles on the uh, back end of the abdomen or little tailpipes. But we have several things going on in this one illustration. Here we see the cast skins where the insect has molted. If we saw only cast skins, then there would be no pest problem here needing to be dealt with. There are so many things that feed on aphids. What's illustrated here is the lady beetle larva that looks a little bit like a, a tiny alligator with its chewing mouth parts. And then we also have an aphid mummy, which is evidence of parasitism. More about that in just a minute. What would be particularly helpful is to know uh, and be able to identify these key beneficial insects. And here I show a short list of beneficial insects or groups of insects. And we'll look at several of these as we go through the session this afternoon. But just be aware that there are numerous beneficial insects. And we can conserve them just by be, being able to recognize them as for their beneficial aspects and not consider them as pets. And sometimes there are a number of lookalikes and mimics. And we'll show a few of those as we go along. But what I'm really trying to emphasize here is that we scout for those beneficials as well as for the pest species. And you never know what you might find out there and be able to categorize it as beneficial. Here are some clues. If we are looking for insects that are predators, uh, notice whether they have the raptorial front legs like, like our praying mantis here, and also the ambush bug. So these legs are perfectly designed for capturing prey. And then these are visual predators. So notice um, that their eyes are very enlarged. And here, here's the ultimate with our dragonfly, uh, where the head is almost entirely eyes. So these, that can be some clues to point towards a predatory habit, an indication that these are beneficial insects. Now it's not only insects that we want to conserve with our management strategies. Spiders are related but are not insects. They have two body parts and eight legs and no antennae, which uh, distinguishes them from the insects that have three body parts, six legs, and two antennae. But certainly predators can be a very important part of the predaceous community. And there are a number of different uh, spider families and species. Here's a crab spider feeding on a stink bug. We have orb weavers. Not all spiders, of course, spin webs, but this particular one does. And in a similar vein, uh, mites also are not insects. We have many, many mites that are predaceous and are beneficial, as well as the phytophagous mites that we're all familiar with that, that feed on uh, plants. Here would be one of the larger examples of a predaceous mite. Many of our insects have uh, species within the same insect family that are predaceous, while some are plant feeders. And being able to tell the difference can be very important. So this would be a predaceous stink bug. This is a particularly colorful species. But note the pronotal extensions, which just means that the shoulder area is extended into points. And so that can be a clue 
suggesting that maybe this stink bug is predaceous rather than plant feeding. But really, the story is in the mouth part. So hopefully, uh, many of you have a hand lens. I carry a hand lens with me all the time, and um, it's very helpful to, to help us to be able to see these key features. So if I flip that stink bug over and I take a look at the mouth parts, if it's a predator, they are going to be very stout mouth parts. If it's a plant feeder, they're going to be much more Slender. Think about why that might be. Why would that predaceous stink bug need to have much stouter mouth parts? Well, they need to deal with the defensive responses of their prey. In other words, this caterpillar is not going to go quietly. And so predaceous stink bugs have much stouter mouth parts in order to deal with the uh, defensive responses of caterpillars or other types of prey. These are generalist predators, meaning they feed on, on just about anything that they can capture that's in the appropriate size range. So let's talk about that brown marmorated stink bug that we mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago. Brown marmorated stink bug is indicated on the left-hand side here. So how would we tell this stink bug, say from some of our native species that are either predaceous or, or rather innocuous. We want to look at the antennae on the brown marmorated stink bug, and they are stri uh, striped rather than unicolorous or the same color. On our brown marmorated stink bug, this pronotal area is quite smooth as opposed to the dentate area here on our Brachamina, which is a wood-dwelling um, type of stink bug. And certainly one of our most valuable predaceous stink bugs is this spine soldier bug, unicolorous antennae, and uh, the pronotum extended into two points but certainly something that we could confuse with our uh, pest stink bug. Here's our spine soldier bug feeding on a Mexican bean beetle larva. So sometimes just observation is going to tell the story. Are they feeding on insects on the plants? Or are they actually feeding on the plants? Now we have to recognize that some of our predaceous insects, especially the predaceous bugs, True bugs probe the plants for moisture, but for the most part, they will be feeding on uh, insect prey, just as we see in this particular picture. Predaceous damsel bugs also fit into this group. And so the predaceous damsel bugs are really a fairly small insect, but they're common in agroecosystems and then also in our home gardens and in our landscapes. And my new pirate bugs. Now these are commercially available and uh, can be used uh, to good effect in managing greenhouse pests, but they're also very commonly occurring in our, our managed landscapes and in our gardens, but often we don't recognize them because they are so small. Can we sh uh, show the video of this little minute pirate bug feeding? At this point, if we could show the video of the little minute pirate bug feeding. And I would love for you to be able to see what I see under the microscope. This gives you an idea of the size. This pirate bug is feeding on uh, well, moth eggs. So that gives you an idea of the size. And then note also as she spins around.
around those mouth parts. So instead of probing a plant, she is actually probing these eggs and she will extract the contents of this uh, pest insect egg. And so these are so common in our landscapes. Uh, often I have gardeners uh, say, I've been bitten by something I couldn't see. Sometimes it may be these little pirate bugs and they are very, very beneficial in the garden. Uh, they're common even in turf grass. And then we'll contrast this on the opposite uh, size spectrum where we have an assassin bug. And this is one of the bigger assassin bugs. It's called a wheel bug because of the uh, process uh, right here on its uh, uh, thorax that gives it, this, it gives it its name of a wheel bug. And it's feeding on a fall webworm. So uh, it's also uh, pierced the fall webworm with, with its mouth parts. And here again, um, we want to be careful about handling an insect such as this because uh, this is a predator. It uh, injects uh, digestive um, fluids that, that help digest the uh, caterpillar prey. And so if you are bitten by this, uh, in particular um, predator, it's like being stung by a hornet and it will uh, leave a welt that can last at least a couple of weeks. And in case you're wondering, that's the voice of experience. So while these are valuable predators, some of our, our insects we want to be careful with handling. But often we will see this predator uh, in the later summer or even in the fall uh, may be attracted to lights where they have come in to feed on caterpillars and uh, I've even seen them feeding on Japanese beetle adults. So they are quite capable of handling fairly large prey. Just a word to say that our uh, beneficial insects don't always feed on what we would like them to feed on. Here in this case, an assassin bug is feeding on a lady beetle. And I mentioned lookalikes. Um, the illustration of your uh, assassin bug in the upper right hand inset, look how similar that is to the squash bug that's right here in this lower inset. They superficially look quite similar. And then also on this buckwheat uh, could look very similar or be confused with the leaf-footed bug, which is distinguished by these enlarged uh, areas on the hind legs. So while these, these two are plant feeders, this is a predator. And a little bit about buckwheat. Uh, sometimes planting various types of flowers can attract natural enemies and provide resources that can help keep natural enemies in the area and can favor pest control. But it's a complicated process. Uh, we want the proper species of natural enemies in high enough populations. These farmscaping resources can help by providing nectar and pollen or shelter or in some cases alternate prey to keep your predators in the area. But they need to be uh, sufficiently close. Um, there needs to be uh, an attraction between the pests on the crops that we're trying to grow to draw, draw them over from these farmscaping areas. And these are living organisms. So sometimes it's difficult to predict, but there has been some work in this area. Uh, field margin man management and within field management. So along the borders, sometimes there are weed or conservation borders that are options or floral plantings like we just mentioned and you see pictured in this slide. And then within fields, uh, consider cover crops conservation tillage, and sometimes intercropping as ways to enhance the activity of natural enemies. 
uh, certain types of plants provide things that natural enemies need. Plants with extrafloral nectaries uh, can provide resources uh, that, that uh, particularly parasitoids would need, small parasitic wasps. There are plants that provide shelter or protective cover, think crimson clover, um, for this particular purpose. And then plants that provide alternate hosts or prey. Uh, crepe myrtles, of course, uh, are attacked by crepe myrtle aphid. Um, but if they're there in low populations, crepe myrtle aphids will not move to any other type of aphid or any other type of plant at all in the landscape. And they serve as a magnet for uh, all the beneficial insects that feed on aphids. And we'll show another example uh, as we go along a little bit later. So plants that have been suggested for use, um, buckwheat, cecilia, cilantro, forage, sunflower, and the clovers. And then there are many others. Sometimes there are mixes uh, sold specifically for this purpose. Border control, beneficial insect mix, good bu bug blend, um, and th these can be very helpful in attracting beneficial insects and uh, the jury's still out on the degree to which they can assist with pest control in adjacent crops. Farmscaping does have benefits. The greatest potential benefits are for aphid and caterpillar pests. Uh, enemies of bug pests have not, not been found to be as commonly uh, facilitated by farmscaping. Uh, the extent to which natural enemies spill over into the crop is not clear. And as I said, variable results. Sometimes this will just depend on some experimentation on your part. And can they attract natural enemies, but sometimes they can also attract pests. So, the, the goal is not to make your pest situation worse. We don't want to compromise any production goals or introduce weeds. So we really know, need to know what the target pests are and then plan the timing so that you provide resources at the time that uh, natural enemies are needed to combat those pests. Let's look at a few more. We saw assassin, assassin bug adults. Let's take a look at assassin bug nymphs. And we know this is a nymph because it does not have the fully developed wings. In fact, we have some wing pads here. But certainly we can see this stout moth part. It is uh, a predaceous species as an immature and as an adult. Plant bugs, again, fall into this group where some are plant feeders and some are predators, and some uh, are a little bit of both. And that's the case with the azalea plant bug. Um, it feeds on whatever it can capture, and the bright red nymph that you see here is feeding on azalea thrips, which occur a little bit earlier in the season than azalea lace bugs but they do switch over and feed on azalea lace bugs. And they also feed a little bit on pollen um, without causing damage to the plant itself. Big-eyed bugs. Uh, these earn their name by having their head wider than the, the area right behind it. So um, big eyes indicate big-eyed bugs. And we want to think about what might be uh, insects that are plant feeders that we could confuse with the big-eyed bug. Big-eyed bugs of uh, at least three species are common in our region. I show you two here. Geochrys punctipes is the grayer little species, and Geochrys uliginosus is the dark black one. Sometimes uliginosus is called a ground dwelling species, um, but there is considerable overlap by both of these uh, species. But think in particular um, that this 
uh, big eye bug can sometimes be confused with chinch bugs and they occur in the same area because our big eye bugs feed quite readily on chinch bugs. So we want to be able to tell the difference. And here our big eye bugs are feeding on fall armyworms, which are shown here in the first instar where they are producing window painting damage on turf. We also see them in the garden. Here uh, you may already recognize that these are squash bug eggs. Well, we often see big-eyed bugs on these eggs. This would be a great spot to show the big-eyed bug video. Because often predators are quite a bit more mobile and are present in fewer numbers than our pest insect species. So we can watch the big-eyed bugs as they move around under the microscope. Move so quickly they just become a little blur. And you can see the little patterns on the uh, pronotum, on the thorax. Ambush bugs that we showed in an earlier slide are uh, found usually in the fall. They're quite showy predators, and we often see them on goldenrod. And here I think uh, we've got an ambush bug on Joe Pieweed and has attacked a fly. Green lace wings also are commercially available, but are readily uh, present in our landscapes, and their activity can be encouraged. You may be familiar with the adults, but have you seen the eggs before? Present on the little stalks. And then as they get ready to hatch, they darken. And so adults, and the eggs are shown here. And then here's the larva. Now the larva looks similar to that lady beetle larva that I mentioned looked like a little alligator. But here, they had the lace wing larva has sickle-shaped mouth parts that it will use to pierce the aphid, and then fluid from the aphid will travel back down the, the buccal channel um, rather than having chewing mouth parts like the lady beetle larva does. Here again, we're feeding on aphids, and we have evidence of parasitism with this aphid mummy. There even can be uh, lace wings that are camouflaged. And we've seen this in a number of different settings. Um, I don't know if you can, let me try to show you. Here's those sickle-shaped mouth parts. So even though this looks like a little moving trash pile, it's really a lace wing. And they've thrown um, aphid carcasses on their back. I've also seen this with uh, on tree bark where it's, um, bark lice or even lichen uh, has been piled on the back of the insect and it's camouflaged in that way. Now here are mantids with an egg case. So you may be familiar with the Chinese mantid and the larger egg cases and then we have several native species that have a smaller egg case. So we would want to, to uh, recognize that, that this would be the egg case of, of mantids. Now we can um, purchase mantid egg cases, but that's really uh, not particularly necessary. And 
And truly, these are the ultimate generalist predator. They feed on so many different things. Uh, here would be an illustration of one of the mantids that we are all uh, very familiar with. But I have seen a great use uh, of a rower collecting these from um, berry bushes around the property. And then we're in a hoop house here in a, a confined area. And so we're using the mantid egg cases in the pots uh, because a, a major problem on these would be white flies. And here we're in a confined area so that when these tiny little praying mantids hatch out of these egg cases, they will immediately need something to feed on and the white flies are exactly the perfect size. And this would be one wonderful use of augmentative biocontrol that uh, is done not through purchase but just collecting what's available in the area. How about flies? There are a number of flies that are predators. So here's a, a robber fly. Um, and here again, uh, this illustrates how many mimics we have out there. Looks very similar to a bumblebee. But in fact, it is a fly. And robber flies are characterized by having heart-shaped heads and a bearded face. And so that is the case here. And one, one of our former students took this picture in the uh, botanical gardens in Athens. So, so these are actually quite common. Uh, several different species of robber flies are common in our area. This shows one that is, uh, has been attracted to our conservation garden area. And then here's a pair of robber flies uh, that we photographed in, in the garden this past spring. Surface flies, also called flower flies or hover flies, are uh, very abundant and particularly useful predators. And it's the immature or maggot stage that does the work here, they are uh, voracious predators of aphids. Tiny little long-legged flies in the family Dolichopodidae. Uh, many of these species are predators. Not a great deal is known about them, but once you start looking, you will see how abundant these are. Okay, how do we feel about paper wasps? Are they beneficial? Or are they pests? And truly, it depends on where they're located and what your perspective is. So our, uh, our paper wasps in this particular picture, a beautiful picture taken by uh, Jerry Abraham, is feeding on a fall armyworm. So they're predators in the right location. They can be very beneficial. But also, I like that they are indicator species, and they can indicate problems not just with caterpillars, but also scales or mealybugs, uh, any kind of insect that produces honeydew. In my little area around Griffin in central Georgia, we have at least 22 different kinds of ground beetles. Uh, so ground beetles are well represented in, in our landscape. This is a, a particularly large example. It's a calisoma beetle. And then here it is from the uh, front end where you really can see those moth parts. Tiger beetles now are included in the ground beetles. And so have you um, observed this before where it looks like a uh, pencil has been pushed into the ground? Well, sometimes we see this in the areas of 
uh, thinning or uh, dying turf. And some people connect this with uh, pest problems. Well, in fact, these are the larvae. Here are the larvae of the, here is the larva of a tiger beetle. And it uh, will be inside these pits, anchored to the side of the pit with these little hooks on a hump on the abdomen. And the head here is all business. It sits up at the surface. And when something crawls close enough of the appropriate size, it can grab it and pull it down in there. So in fact, these are not responsible for the damage. They've moved in to prey on whatever insects were responsible for the damage. And the adult is this beautiful jewel-colored beetle, also uh, very heavily predaceous. So while these are very visible, we have some other beetles that we don't often uh, pay too much attention to. In our area, we have 18 different phenotypes. Uh, of rove beetles. They can look similar to an earwig because they have the shortened elytra and you can see the abdominal segments, but they don't have the, um, the typical earwig pictures. They do have some cerci, but they are, they're not earwigs and in fact they are e often either predators, decomposers, or we have uh, several species that, that uh, uh, and even of the uh, ground beetles, that can feed on weed seeds. Here's an illustration of a soldier beetle, just another beetle that we should uh, be on the lookout for in our gardens. Uh, several pictures of lady beetles because sometimes uh, lady beetles don't fit the usual pattern. Here we have a lady beetle that can even mimic a mealybug. So we want to be sure that uh, we're not treating for uh, predators here. Uh, certain lady beetles can be very specific predators of mites or of mealybugs or of scales. And then some are quite generalist predators feeding on aphids. And then we also mentioned the uh, larvae. And not all larvae fit this red and black pattern. We've got quite, quite a few differences. For example, if we were looking at this scale insect and it's oleander scale, and if I flipped over the top of this oleander scale, I might see this little larva in here. I think we have another little video that shows this larva moving. And so this is a tiny lady beetle larva. It's very pale in color, uh, just about the same color as the scale body once we flipped over that scale cover. So as we mentioned in the, one of the very first slides, we want to scout for those beneficials as well as for the pest insects. Really know whether your pest problem is increasing, decreasing, or staying the same. And what about the beneficials associated with your, with your um, are they increasing? Are they sufficient to handle the problem? And just a moment about lookalikes again, because we do have just a couple of uh, beetles in this same family that are plant feeders. We mentioned one already with the Mexican bean beetle, and then there is also a squash beetle. So the eggs would look very similar to other lady beetle eggs. And the adults also can resemble some of our predaceous species. And then uh, can you tell what's happening in this particular picture? Here we do have one of our uh, wonderful predaceous lady beetles. Does anybody know what's happening right here? What is this particular larva? I bet you all have good guesses. This is a potato beetle larva.
Now let's look at the parasitoids. Um, we've talked a lot about the predators in our systems, but in fact, the parasitoids may be even more beneficial than the predators and more numerous, but they are uh, much less likely to be seen. So I often get questions about what's on that hornworm? What are that? People say, what are the eggs on that hornworm? When in, in fact, they're these are the cocoons of parasitic wasps. So parasites have developed inside the hornworm and consumed most of the internal content. When they become uh, full grown, they will bore through the integument or the skin of that caterpillar, spin their cocoons, and then pop the tops to fly off and parasitize other caterpillars. So if you get that question, uh, should I kill this or should I leave it? Then, of course, the answer is we want to leave these as another source of parasitoids uh, that can move on and, and parasitize other pests. Here we have an example of a parasitic wasp um, parasitizing stink bug eggs. And sometimes, truly, we have to look for evidence of parasitism because they're going to be so, so, so tiny that we won't be able to see them. This is a parasitoid, a tiny uh, mimarid wasp, or fairy fly, I think is the common name, that's no bigger than the leaf here on an azalea. It attacks and lays its egg in an azalea lace bug egg, completes its entire development in the egg, and the only thing we will ever see is where it chewed its way out of that azalea lace bug egg. So this is what we want to be looking at. It can just be seen with a hand lens, but we have to look hard. Here's that aphid mummy shot again. And in this illustration, we can see where the parasitoid has chewed its way out of the of the aphid. Here's just another shot of that. These are oleander aphids feeding on milkweed. And the dark contrast allows us to really see those corticals. And then here is a parasitized aphid. Uh, puffed up and looks like a mini football. And then you can see where the parasitic wasp has uh, emerged from this aphid and will go on lay her egg in another aphid, or many aphids. And this is an illustration of what that tiny parasitic wasp would look like. So very, very small and would be visible to the keen observer, but uh, very often what we are really looking for is evidence that they have left behind so that we know that parasitoids are at work. And here's a picture of life on a milkweed. So there is an aphid that is very specific. And that oleander aphid is the one that we mentioned. It will be on the milkweed. But then look at all the things that are attracted to feed on the aphids on the milkweed that can then move on to other aphids in the same area. Lady beetles, surface fly larvae, uh, lace wings. And then here again, we see aphid mummies. And truly, it doesn't get much more beautiful than this native milkweed that's common to our area. And they can withstand aphid pressure and still uh, remain quite vigorous and then act as uh, a resource to pull in your natural enemies. Would you treat for this problem? It looks pretty severe. But truly, uh, there's very little pest insect left alive in this picture because you can see all the parasitoid emergence holes. Just as there were predaceous flies, there are also parasitic flies. 
Now they're not all as brightly colored as, as this particular species. In fact, most of them would resemble uh, house flies. Uh, one thing I like to do is look for, again, evidence of parasitism. And I uh, took these pictures of yellow striped armyworms where the tachinids had deposited their eggs uh, pretty near the head. And this, this is an a effective strategy that keeps from the caterpillar from being able to, to groom these parasitic eggs off. So even though we may not uh, be readily able to tell parasitic flies, we can certainly tell whether tachinids have deposited eggs on some of these pest insects. Now I don't want to leave out some of the entomal pathogens because uh, some of our natural enemies can uh, be viruses or fungi or bacteria. And so it's helpful to be able to recognize insects that are succumbing or have succumbed to disease. Nematodes are also used uh, quite a bit in biological control. Some species certainly are commercially available, but then they are also naturally occurring. Fungal pathogens are quite common and have the effect quite often of, of um, altering the behavior of the insect that they've infected so that they climb high on the plant, attach to the plant, and become very stiff, and then uh, when the pathogens um, produce spores, which are not always white fuzz as you see here, but can appear as green or even red, then those uh, entomal pathogens can be more readily spread. And I want to leave you uh, uh, with my sense of fascination about this world of natural enemies and just show you some of the behaviors that you might see if you become a regular observer of biological control in action. This is a, a small parasitoid. We talked earlier about uh, predaceous stink bugs overcoming uh, the defensive responses of their prey. Well, here a caterpillar senses the vibration of this parasitoid, this little wasp on the leaf, and drops down on a silken thread to escape attack by this wasp. But the wasp has none of this. It hangs on with three of its six legs and repels down the silken thread as fast as the caterpillar can let out that silken thread. The parasitoid can go faster until it senses it's within range, spins around, inserts its ovipositor, and lays an egg. And so many things happen at that point in time. The parasitoid can sense whether that caterpillar is already parasitized and makes it, and whether it's the right species. So it instantly makes a decision to lay an egg or not, and then flies on to repeat the process. So a few tips to conserve and protect our beneficial. We want to use pesticides only when absolutely necessary. Spot spray rather than cover spray. Uh, we have choices. We can apply those that are least toxic to beneficial. Provide uh, resources, water and shelter. Maybe plant a variety of flowers that provide season-long nectar, pollen, and even alternative prey. Uh, we can develop a tolerance for some plant damage that allows time for beneficials to increase. So we can strongly influence the uh, occurrence and abundance of natural enemies. And then there are just a number of flowers that are very attractive 
to beneficial insects. And this is a list of a few of those beneficial insects. You need to find those that are regionally appropriate uh, for your particular area. And then for those of you that are close enough, I invite you all to come to our research and education garden on the UGA Griffin campus and, and see some of this in action where we have our research plots that are readily available uh, for you to see research in progress. And I hope that we will see some of you uh, in the, on our UGA Griffin campus. Thank you so much. This would be a great time to, to answer any questions. I, I see a, a, we have some over on the chat box. I don't know if, it, if they've all been asked or answered. Hey, Chris, we have a couple of them here. Um, I'm going back to um, find them here. Um, we had a great discussion in the chat box about hornworms while I'm looking for these other two questions. Okay. Uh, the dilemma over, you know, how do you know whether you should bleed your hornworms because they're going to be parasitized and, and, or, and how do you know or should you just go ahead and squish them? So uh, between those two approaches. Right. Uh, certainly, if you can see that they've already been parasitized, because they have the parasitoid cocoons on the back, that's a that's a given. But uh, in fact, you can't always tell. Fair enough. Um, we have a couple of uh, other questions here. Uh, what's a good way to encourage lacewings? Uh, lacewings just by providing those uh, additional flower sources because they can benefit from the nectar and the pollen. Uh, and they, they are very abundant in landscapes. I think once we start uh, actually uh, adults all the time, but uh, once you start seeing those eggs on their stalks, the illustration I showed, they were extremely new. Single spot in the larvae. All right. Um, before we go to another question, Suzanne, do you have some poll questions for us uh, that you can pop up? We think we have four questions that we're going to pop up. In addition, if you have some more time, if you can go to the link that um, Ellen just pasted in the chat box, we have even a few more questions that we would appreciate your answering. It'll help us do better webinars for you. Good. I see our, our poll coming up, which is great. Now, Chris, while we're uh, talking on questions, is there a predator for the ligus bug? Uh, yes. Many of the generalist predators do feed on, the, on ligus bugs. In fact, almost all of the generalist uh, true bug predators that we mentioned would feed on ligus bugs. And they have a couple of specific uh, parasitoids, but I'm not familiar enough to know to be able to indicate their species. Okay. And uh, for the person asking about the list of flowers, we will go back to that list of flowers in just a minute. Um, we had a discussion about Predilor, Chris, uh, in the chat box. Um, do you know anything about Predilor? Yes, I'm not. So, I'm sorry, I don't. I'm not following. Do I know anything about? It's called Predilor. Oh, Predilor. Yeah. yeah. Predilor is a, um, an attractant for um, the two-spine soldier bugs that that. Uh, was developed. I don't know if it's still commercially available, but it was uh, sold commercially for a number of years. We might uh, check some of the uh, beneficial uh, insect catalogs and see if it's st still available. It was developed uh, USDA in Belleville. Okay. Fantastic. Um, 
I'm just checking on um, the... Tim, can you help me out here in the chat box? I'm copying a little, doing a little work here, copying this um, evaluation, too. Okay. I think the other thing that we had uh, the question about was um, getting, getting either your handout or putting a slide up with the, with the uh, farmscape plants that you had. Okay. If everyone's taking the poll, then we can go back to that, that question. We're going to assume everyone's taken the poll, and um, Chris, if, I think you can just go ahead. If, uh, Suzanne, if you take the poll down, then um, Chris can go back and find that slide. We'll just click back through. Which one are we looking for? The, so, we're looking for the, the slide with the plants, the, the track. That one there probably is one of them. So this would be one of them, and then we had uh, under the little farmscape discussion, there was a list of... Yes. Yeah, that was the other one that you had a list of. Mm -hmm. So do we want to give this one just a second for people to look at that? Sounds good. And this will be recorded if you just go right back to this learn.extension.org and uh, search on Beneficial Garden Helpers, the same link you went to here. Uh, will instead of showing a connect information for the webinar, it will show uh, a link to the recording. So that should be available by noon on Monday. I think one more question in the chat box. Um, how can I encourage parasitic flies to take care of yellow striped army worms in my garden? And, and there again, they can often be attracted to plants, and we want, want to um, provide a lot of seasonal uh, things that will bloom all season long that will attract these flies. It'll take me just a second to come back to the garden. There we go. And I think I think probably a big point on the ornamental side, uh, especially, is that. Uh, to, in order to increase the numbers of beneficial insects, we have to be willing to tolerate a certain amount of pest presence so that we can attract them and keep them in the area. Let's see. Um, Anne Marie was asking, she was late, she was asking why the flowers? I, I guess if you could mention just briefly, Chris, about what the flowers are doing for us. Well, flowers provide resources for that will be attractive to beneficial insects, but also that they need in terms of uh, gathering energy, uh, providing the nutrition that they need. Uh, in order to then be able to prey on other insects or to um, parasitize, lay their eggs in other insects. So they promote occurrence and abundance of beneficial insects by providing resources that those beneficial insects need. And, and by having more of the flowers that are often visited by beneficial insects in the area, it just increases the chances that you will attract them to the spot where you really want to have those pest control benefits.
Okay. Um, I am not seeing any more questions. We're having a little bit more discussion. Um, Ellen, do you have any closing comments? Um, I don't have any more comments. Thank you all for participating today. And for those of you who took the survey, we appreciate your feedback. And Chris, certainly thank you for all your help. And I think we can sign off on the recording now. Thanks to everyone for attending. Thank you. <laughs>